This presentation is part of the TI in Focus AP Calculus video series. In this video, I'll discuss the solutions, relevant concepts, and scoring guidelines associated with some of the parts of our 2020 mock AP Calculus exam, Form AB Question 1. My name is Steve Kokoska. I'm a professor at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania, and I'm a former AP Calculus chief reader. Form AB Question 1 involves a continuous function f with domain minus 2 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 9. The graph of f is given, and it consists of three line segments and two quarter circles. A new function g is defined as g of x is the definite integral from 0 to x of f of t dt for minus 2 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 9. In part c, the student needs to find the open intervals on which g is increasing and concave down, and they need to provide a reason for their answer. Here are some key concepts that we'll need in order to answer this question. First, here's the definition of a function increasing or decreasing on an interval i. Note that this definition is given in terms of an interval as we move left to right, and it does not involve the derivative of f. However, the derivative of f can indeed reveal where a function is increasing or decreasing. Here's the statement of this id test, and we'll take a closer look at this in a minute. If f prime of x is greater than 0 on an interval, then f is increasing on that interval. And if f prime of x is less than 0 on an interval, then f is decreasing on that interval. Here's a closer look at this increasing-decreasing test, and some justification for this result. Consider the graph of the function f. Between the values x equal a and x equal b, and between x equals c and x equals d, the tangent lines to the graph of f have positive slopes. Therefore, f prime of x is greater than 0. Similarly, between the values x equals b and x equals c, the tangent lines to the graph of f have negative slopes. Therefore, f prime of x is less than 0. So, the increasing-decreasing test makes sense, and we can visualize this graphically. And you can also prove this using the mean value theorem, and I won't do that on this video, but this is a nice application of the MVT, and it's a student-accessible proof. To solve part C, we'll also need to recall the definition of concave up and concave down, and connect this definition to the derivative of the function. This definition is given in terms of the tangent line. It says if f is a differentiable function, then f is concave up at a if the graph of f is above the tangent line to f at a for all x in a neighborhood containing a, but not equal to a. Similarly, f is concave down at a if the graph of f is below the tangent line to f at a for all x in a neighborhood containing a, but not equal to a. Here's a closer look at this definition. First, a neighborhood is just an open interval containing a, and a neighborhood doesn't have to be a symmetric interval about a. And note that concavity here is defined in terms of a single number, not an interval, like increasing and decreasing. So the graph of a function can be concave up, concave down, or have no concavity at a number. Here are some graphs to illustrate this definition of concavity, and to emphasize the idea that concavity is defined at a value, not over an interval. Here, the graph is concave up at x equal a. There's a neighborhood of a in which the graph of f lies above the tangent line. In this graph, f is concave down at x equal a. The graph of f lies below the tangent line in a neighborhood of a. And here's an example in which the graph of f has no concavity at x equal a. We can't find a neighborhood of a containing a such that the graph of f is entirely above or entirely below the tangent line. 
The second derivative can be used to help determine the intervals of concavity. If f is concave up, as x moves from left to right, the slope of the tangent line is increasing. And this means that the derivative f prime is an increasing function, and therefore its derivative f double prime is positive. Similarly, if f double prime of x is less than zero for all x in an interval i, the graph of f is concave down on i. Here's a closer look at this concavity test. It allows us to draw a conclusion about the concavity of the graph of f if f double prime of x is greater than zero or if f double prime of x is less than zero. We need to consider separately those numbers a where f double prime of a is equal to zero or f double prime of a doesn't exist. Now, just a reminder, the graph of f is either concave up, concave down, or has no concavity at a number a. And although we won't need this concept in this problem, it seems reasonable to remind you here about the point on the graph where f changes concavity, called an inflection point. So, finally, let's use all of these concepts to solve this problem. Here's the graph of f equal g prime g is increasing where g prime equal f is positive on these three intervals, indicated in green on the graph. g is concave down where g prime equal f is decreasing on these intervals, indicated in maroon on the graph. g is increasing and concave down where these intervals intersect, minus 2 to minus 1, and 5 to 7, which can be seen in the graph where the green and maroon intervals overlap. Here are the scoring guidelines for part C, worth two points. One point for the answer, which is the two intervals, and one point for the reason. Here are some interpretations of these guidelines to help award points. The first point, the answer point, is earned for the correct intervals, both of them and they can be reported as open, closed, or even half open. We won't worry about the endpoints, at least not in this problem. And there is an eligibility criteria here for the second point. The student must earn the first point to be eligible for the second. Now, there is sort of an exception here. If a student reports one correct interval with a correct reason, they earn one point in this part. A reason given by the student that references or uses only g prime is eligible for the second point. However, a reason given by the student that uses only f is not eligible for the second point unless the student has made the connection that g prime equals f, and they must do that somewhere in parts a, b, or here in c. There are a couple of ways that the student can convey that g prime is decreasing. They could say that g double prime is negative, or they could say that the slope of g prime is negative. Both of those are okay. And in this case, references to the function, or the slope, or it, are just too vague, and they do not earn the reason point or the second point. In part d, we need to find the value of g of minus 1. And this question includes one of those constant reminders on the AP Calculus exam. Show the computations that lead to your answer. I think there are two important concepts needed to solve this problem. The first is that the definite integral can be interpreted as net area. So to solve this problem, we should use geometry to find areas. Now, some students may attempt to find an algebraic expression for f and then an analytic antiderivative. And although that method would work, it's just not a judicious approach to solve this problem. And the second concept we need here involves a reversal of limits in a definite integral. So the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to negative the integral from b to a of f of x dx. If we reverse the limits, then we need a negative sign in front. Now you can justify this property by thinking about Riemann sums and the definition of delta x 
the width of each subinterval. OK, here's the solution. Here's the graph of f. g of minus 1 is equal to this definite integral by definition. Now the first thing I'll do is reverse the limits and place the negative sign out in front. Now just a note that this problem can be solved without reversing the limits, but I find it easier to compute net area when the limits of integration are a is less than b. Now I need the area of the shaded region, which is a triangle. And I need a negative sign because, well, the region is below the x-axis. So the final answer here is simply 1. The scoring guidelines for this problem are pretty straightforward. One point for the answer, but supporting work is needed. In other words, a bald 1, that is a number 1 appearing alone on the page, does not earn the point. There must be some supporting work to convince you that the student is using an area argument to arrive at this answer. Part E is similar to Part D. We need to evaluate G of 2. But the geometric region here isn't quite as simple. Once again, here's the graph of F. G of 2 is, by definition, the definite integral from 0 to 2 of F of t dt. This definite integral represents the net area of the shaded region. Note that this is entirely below the x-axis, so the answer has to be negative. Now, this isn't a very nice geometric region. It's not like a rectangle or a triangle or even a trapezoid. However, I can find the area by finding the area of a square and subtracting the area of a quarter circle. So here's the calculation with the negative sign because, well, this region is below the x-axis. And finally, the answer is pi minus 4, which is negative, thank goodness. This problem was worth two points. One point for using the area of a quarter circle in the calculation, and one point for the final answer. A reminder here that the response from the student does not need to include a definite integral. They can go directly to area calculations. Now the correct answer, pi minus 4, without any supporting work, earns only one point. We do want to see the computations that lead to the answer. Remember that the AP Calculus curriculum is stressing good communication skills. And finally, if the answer is wrong, but there is evidence that the area of the correct quarter circle is being used in the calculation, that would earn one point. I hope this video gives you a good idea of how to solve these problems using the necessary AP Calculus concepts. We'll look at more parts of this free response question in the next video.